um, cafe topic is um, can localism revive community and challenge consumer society? And our guest today is Jenny Birkenbosch, who is sitting behind me. And Jenny, among, being, among her other accomplishments, is um, probably the owner of what I would say is the prettiest farm. And I don't say that lightly, like we went out to their property in Gibbons and everything is arranged so beautifully. And I, I took one look at that and I thought this could only be the farm of someone who is an artist. <laughs> and Jenny, in addition to uh, being co-owner with her husband of Sundog Organic Farm, is also an accomplished artist. And if any of you are curious to see uh, more of her artworks, many of the recent works I think Jenny's done are kind of inspired by some, some organic um, images and things from, from her work on the farm. So she has a website. It's uh, jenniferbirkenbosch.ca, if any of you are curious to see more of her artwork. Um, but Jenny is also serves on the board of the farmer's market. And I think her and her husband have made this shift um, into owning their own farm within the last couple of years. And I'm confident she'll have interesting things to say about what that means for them as a family and how that relates to this localism topic for today. So will you join me in uh, welcoming Jenny? Thank you very much for your warm welcome. It's my pleasure to be here today and to talk about this topic with you. I'm looking forward to the, the conversation that um, we'll have after my introduction. Um, so, as Becky said, my husband James and I are new farmers, and uh, we entered into farming partly out of maybe what I would describe as a restlessness in the city. We had a small bungalow, you know, pretty standard life. We had, well, we had one child when we started farming, and, and our second one was born the first year that we um, grew food on James's parents' land. I'm already totally not following my words. So I'll just focus. Um, we felt maybe that it wasn't as meaningful a life as we were hoping to live when we, you know, first got married as young. Woo! First got married as young people. We had big visions and big dreams, and we found ourselves being restless. And um, maybe there wasn't that much in our life in the city that we could engage in or as much as we knew we wanted to or, or maybe we didn't um, love what, where we were or what we were doing as much as we knew we were capable of loving um, life. So we began a journey to search for a way to make meaning in Edmonton um, and to love it in a kind of committed way. And I distinguished the, the fact that we were Making or searching for a way to make meaning in Edmonton because we knew that it wasn't really an option to move away. Edmonton's not always a place that I felt like um, I wanted to make a home. I've lived in many different places in my life because my dad is a restless spirit. And um, so I've been exposed to many different places, but somehow I felt like uh, I needed to pick one place, and Edmonton is where I was born. I have family in Edmonton. James's family is from Edmonton, and so it wasn't really an option for us to move away and to set roots somewhere else. It didn't feel, didn't feel right. So um, it began with local food, and after our first child was born, I read a few books, and probably you've heard of them because they were quite popular and are still. Barbara Kingsolver's Animal Vegetable Miracle and Michael Pollan's Omnivore's Dilemma were among the books that I read that really um, challenged me. And my husband and I and some of our friends also agreed to grow uh, and source our own food from with a 100-mile radius for 100 days, the 100-mile diet. Many of, many of you know what that is. The following summer... We raised the bar a little bit. We loved being outside. We loved growing food. And um, we thought, OK, well, we need to make this work. And so we started a market garden. And we had the luxury of having access to my husband's parents' small acreage and facilities that they used for 30 years um, as market gardeners. So we had coolers. We had a washing facility. We had everything there. So there wasn't a lot of risk involved in terms of shifting to that scale of um, agricultural production. And the following summer, 
or Ed, we met with success that very first year because I think Edmonton at that point was hungry for another enterprise like ours, and um, we were encouraged. So we did it again and began in earnest to look for our own land. And a year ago, we committed to a piece of land, and um, the sale of the land didn't actually go through until about a month and a half ago. So we were taking a bit of a risk because um, we began the process exactly a year ago, actually, of setting up a farmstead on what was, up until last year, a field that would have been planted entirely in either uh, wheat or canola or peas. Last year it was potatoes. So in order to live and work on this piece of land, we have had to do a number of things. And I just want to give you a sense of what this year has been like for us. Um, so we had to first build a driveway so that, and build some building pads so that we could move our mobile home and uh, onto the property. And then we installed gas and power lines. Um, we had to dig a well. We had to install a septic system. And I should say, too, that those things were not in place when we moved in in the middle of December with our two young children. <laughs> and uh, we lived a little bit like pioneers. <laughs> we didn't melt water or melt snow for water. We had neighbors that we could get water from, but it was close to that. Um, we, so we installed our septic system just before Christmas, we built greenhouses, we plotted our fields, we buried thousands of feet of irrigation line, we've planted a tree nursery <clears throat> to create a shelter belt for our trees, or for our farm. Um, we planted many of our perennials, most of them, and, and then we grew food for the market. Um, we are at the end of what will hopefully be one of our more insane years, and we're still walking, although I'm sitting now. Um, we've been on this land physically living there for nine and a half months, and indeed it feels as though we have given birth to something complete, but also infantile, because the amount of work that lies ahead is staggering. During brief moments when I've had the time and energy left at the end of the day to be reflective, I've, I've had the following thoughts that relate to our topic today, and I, will, and, and I hope that these thoughts will give some fodder to our conversation um, following this introduction. The first one is, and, and I just want to say too that the, the rest of my talk is just a collection of thoughts that I've had in response to the question posed today, and I hope that um, you understand that it's not meant to be sort of a cohesive, tidy package, but rather something that might lead to different areas of conversation. Um, the first thing that I want to say is that it takes time to learn your land. I am acutely aware that what we are doing creating in, in creating a homestead and growing food, um, making art, and raising kids are things that are not immediately gratified. More likely, we will be, we will be enjoying the fruit of our labors in many years from now. We're enjoying some of them, but it sure is hard work. Um, and the second comment that I wanted to make is that what started as an adventure in discovering our locale uh, through sourcing our food locally has led us to some, somewhat of a scary place where our commitment to this vision has been tested because it is just plain old bloody hard work to be engaged in this manner. And I'm grateful because it means that my ideals are moving beyond just being ideals and turning into tangible reality that will somehow leave me shaped and marked and because I trust the choice from the very beginning, I'm okay with being shaped, in spite of the fact that sometimes it's difficult. Um, and thirdly, when I set out to commit to this place, both by farming with my husband James and also through my art, I believe that I'm doing two things. And this is sometimes what gives me strength to keep on doing them. One is setting deep roots. And the other thing is that I'm conditioning the metaphorical soil uh, by making it healthier and, I believe, more receptive for continued growth. Um, and I'll just explain or I'll uh, expand on that point a minute. Because I believe that when one committed labor of love is undertaken, more will be born from it. And, I, and also by way of example, James and I ourselves have really benefited from his parents' own commitment to this place. They were certified organic vegetable farmers 
for 35 years and I think made a brave choice back when they did and, and really conditioned the soil for other people to do interesting things, I think. Um, it doesn't always have to do with farming, but somehow that's what we're, we're in. Um, now, in direct response to the question posed for today's discussion, I want to say that I certainly think that um, localism can revive community. And I've experienced that firsthand many times, even within our small uh, farmer's market community. We have a really wonderful exchange happening every Saturday we go there. I eat, I eat amazing, beautiful food, and it's all done in trades. Oh, I'll give you some tomatoes if you give me a loaf of bread. And with that come come relationships, and those are really rich, and I appreciate them very much. I kind of think that people who do farmer's markets are a little bit crazy, and so we all get along really well, <laughs> most of the time. Um, and in response to the second part of the question, can localism challenge consumer society, uh, I just want to say that in order to be in order to be truly effective, the impetus for the local movement, I believe, needs to be focused on engagement of place and celebration of what is local, rather than having anything to do directly with consumerism. And I think shifting consumer focus is simply a byproduct um, from the local or of the local movement. So I think it's more important maybe to think less of, of it from a consumer perspective than just in being engaged, because I think that that follows naturally. Um, and in regards to being locally engaged, I have the following comments. Uh, number one, that the more we rely on technology, the less engaged we are. And I think that the vast majority of people would find reasons to disagree with me on that point, because in many ways, technology helps folks to be connected. And I, I recognize that. But I guess my... My mantra with that is moderation, moderation, and always moderation. Um, but the, the, So what I want to say about that is that the more time spent in virtual reality, the less time is spent um, chatting with one's children, walking on one's sidewalks, enjoying the parks, uh, tasting one's food, and just being fully aware and engaged of where we are. Um, in particular, I think that television is one of the biggest culprits in disengaging us. And I probably have a lot of kindred spirits in this crowd. Um, I don't let my kids watch TV except for on pizza movie night every Friday. And it's a big treat and it's a family time. So I let it go. However, the times that they do watch TV at their grannies or at the babysitters or sometimes when I'm sick and I, you know, bend the rule, I find that the kids shift. They become temporarily less creative, um, less focused and restless. And I think that TV carries us away from our reality. And this is largely why it is so appealing and so popular, because sometimes our reality just sucks. And we want to get away from it. Television promises us ease of life, uh, simplicity and convenience. And I know certainly that living as locally as possible is neither simple nor convenient. Um, a last few thoughts that I hope you might respond to as well are totally totally just unrelated, but things that I thought maybe were, could, could possibly be interesting. Um, the first is that localism in Canada, particularly in our, particularly in our part of Canada, uh, is an interesting idea because we have so little to lose if we don't engage in it in some ways. I've lived in Europe and I know that in comparison to a town in, say, the Netherlands or in Italy, uh, for instance, where layers upon layers of life have been lived and there are massive things at stake if a sense of time and place is lost. In Edmonton, we have both the task of setting down roots but also figuring out what we're about. So I think that that poses an interesting twist on the whole localism um, global movement for us here in this place. Um, and the last comment that I want to make is um, that one of the most effective ways to be universally relevant is by being deeply intimate with exactly where we are. So thank you very much for letting me come here and share with you my thoughts and a little bit of my family's life. <laughs> oh, 
I'm sorry. I always like to put in a little Mary Oliver whenever I can to spread the Mary Oliver love. So I actually have a poem I'd like to read to end, rather than ending with my own words. This is from her book called Thirst, and the poem is called The Place I Want to Get Back To. <clears throat> the place I want to get back to is where, in the pine woods, in the moments between the darkness and first light, two deer came walking down the hill, and when they saw me, they said to each other, okay, this one is okay. Let's see who she is and why she is sitting on the ground like that, so quiet, as if asleep or in a dream but anyway harmless. And so they came on their slender legs and gazed upon me, not unlike the way I go out to the dunes and look and look and look into the faces of flowers. And then one of them leaned forward and nuzzled my hand. And what can my life bring to me that could exceed that brief moment? For 20 years, I have gone every day to the same woods, not waiting exactly, just lingering, such gifts bestowed can't be repeated. If you want to talk about this, come to visit. I live in the house near the corner, which I have named Gratitude. Thank you, Mary Oliver. Uh, as you recall, our pattern has been to... Um, the first person to speak to the issue or theme uh, the kind of avenue they wish to explore, I would like those who are interested in exploring that perspective and participating in that part of the conversation to uh, raise your hand and then I'll put you on next. And then we will shift to a new theme after, after several people have, have um, entered in. Rebecca. Thanks, Jenny. <laughs> Um, there's, there's a couple things that your questions made me start to think about, but one of, one of the questions that I've heard frequently asked, or one of the challenges, I think, for the local food movement is people who say, oh, well, that would be great, but it's too costly, or I can't afford because, <clears throat> you know, the produce is so much more expensive, or, you know, how would you respond to people who, who say something like that? Like, is the local food movement just for the elite who can afford it, or is it for everyone? Well, I certainly wouldn't consider James and myself in the elite uh, stratum of, strata of society. And I know that a lot of our customers are not. It's just a choice that they've made. And I had a real great guy working for us this year. He's a real cheapskate. And he said to me, you know, I was at Superstore and their carrots looked like crap and they were like the same price as ours. And I was like, yeah, well, it's true. I mean, you can, you can probably find deals if you want to. Uh, I don't know. I just think the cost is reflective of, of true life, you know. Well, and you know, my kids have helped somewhat ever since my kids helped on the farm. They now call the supermarket carrots the soap carrots. <laughs> and they're like, are these from the farm? That's what they ask before they eat the carrots. But anyway, I just wanted to get a little bit at that question of choice that you're saying. Because I think um, a lot of times what goes in to our food, our clothing, all those items that are made internationally is invisible. And um, I guess one of my things that I've come to value about this kind of local movement is it's not invisible. When you know the person who baked the bread at the market, or when I know your vegetables, or when I know whatever, it's not invisible. And when you know what goes into something, I think you have a different sense of value of what it's worth. I think, too, it can help us maybe focus. We just need less stuff. We don't need to buy so much stuff. So maybe when we spend more dollars focusing on buying, you know, something that we feel good about uh, and, and we trust and we can go back to that person and say, you know what, that squash wasn't very good. They're happy to give you a new one or whatever. Um, but it can help us to, to, to rein it in a bit. We don't need all that stuff. We just don't. Do you eat differently as a result? 
Um, I, yeah, certainly. I, I, if I think back to the beginning of, you know, when I started to cook for myself, or when I got married and we were, you know, making a home and so on, we eat very differently now than we did then. Much, much healthier for one thing. Yeah. The healthier part is maybe obvious, but what, 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 what would the unobvious parts be? It tastes better. <laughs> That's maybe obvious too, but I just, I mean, you, you get used to eating the, uh, the good market food that we eat and you can't really, you can't go back. Is it simpler? Is the cooking simpler? No. No, certainly not. We have so much diversity of flavor and product, and um, I don't think it's simpler at all. May I mean, maybe it's simpler in the sense that no, it's not simpler. We can grow a lot of stuff, mm -hmm. and we can have a lot of fun experimenting with different flavors and different textures and different even cultural cuisines. Uh, I mean, our capacity to grow food in Edmonton is tremendous, probably compared to what many people's experience of growing food here is. Um, I, uh, I have a question in terms of the simplicity of the food. If you go to Safeways and you buy carrots, potatoes, whatever, they're clean, they're ready to be cooked directly. If you grow your own food, you have to dig it up, you have to wash it, sort it, uh, <laughs> store it, uh, prepare it. It takes much more time, much more effort. If you're squeamish, uh, you know, you, you even get to pick out the worms from the roots and uh, all the other little creepy crawlies that are around that food. Um, I think that it would be a very, very hard sell for people who are raised in cities and have nothing but instant, you know, pre-prepared food um, to eat or to prepare. <laughs> I, have two, I have two uh, comments to, to say back. Simple is not easy. That's the first one. Simple is not easy. The second comment is, and you can come to our booth at the farmer's market because we do all that cleaning and sorting and packaging for you. <laughs> and it's all fresh and local. But, but if, you're, if you're going to try to encourage people in the city to say do something like grow their own food or participate in that whole process of, of, of creating their own food, how can you get them to take the, the leap in terms of, um, well, lifestyle and attitude? to be able to say, have a garden in the back of their, their place or, or grow tomatoes on the porch or, you know, participate in the actual pro production of the food. And I think that's really valuable. I think that it's wonderful when people can do that. But I think, especially if you've shifted away from that kind of lifestyle, it takes baby steps to get back to that. Maybe growing some tomatoes in a pot on your front step is a good way to start. But I also think that... Um, no, I should. My thought went flying away. Um, I also. Th um, what was I going to say? Oh, I, I know. It, it has to come from within that person. I can't make somebody feel compelled to grow a garden. I mean, that's not. It has to come from a, a desire from within that person or whatever. You know. I, but I do think that if if there are a lot of customers that we have who are, don't have the opportunity to grow a garden at all. They're in condos in the middle of downtown, but they can still access beautiful locally grown product very easily. So I, I mean, that's, those are two ways to, to either start small, baby steps, or, or, or purchase your food from somebody that you trust. Well, I, I, I'm, I'm just a little bit skeptical about how we make the leap into getting people to accept this. Uh, anyway. Sure. That's fine. Well, We're shifting the... Oh, but can I just respond to Oh, sure. Then, then we'll come. I guess I could be the poster child for making the leap. Um, I grew up in New York City. 
My parents didn't grow anything, not even flowers. It was just, we didn't do anything. And a couple years ago, Jenny and James and a couple of other families were like, hey, do you want to come and do some stuff on the farm? And I was like, I don't think you want me there because I don't know how to plant things. And I mean, I was, you know, my parents also did not prepare food from scratch. So so I certainly was not, like, I, I would be much more on the lines of what you were just describing. Like, I didn't get my hands in dirt pretty much ever past the age of about seven, unless I was sweeping it out the door. So for me, it was a little bit of a, oh, I don't think I'm gonna be very good at this, and my husband is much better because he had farm experience, but um, if you're asking, you know, how, how do you get people to take the leap? I think for me, it was just trying it. You know, just, okay, well, I don't know anything about this. I'm not, I read the Barbara Kingsolver book too, and it made me crazy, and I thought, well, I'm interested enough to at least try this. <laughs> and, it, and it really wasn't until I had, you know, a very minimal experience, like, of planting something and growing things and eating things. That, that's, that's what sold me on it. But I was that person you're describing. I mean, so I think um, there's something about giving kids the opportunity to try something like that. That's what, to me, sells it. It's just... You know, it's it, and it, and I'm not as far down the line. You know, like I'm not a hundred mile diet. I tried, but I'm still not very good at it because I like my various teas or you know whatever it is. But it was it was just an experiment to try it. And and so I guess for me, if I if you ask me what what made you take the leap, it was like just getting my hands in some dirt. Do you want to speak to this issue? Yeah, just very okay. We talk about LEAP, transitioning, and whatnot. It's actually out there. Some of the schools have small gardens where the children are encouraged to come and participate. You can walk to any number of seniors' homes and you'll find that they've uh, facilitated the seniors' needs by having gardens and whatnot, allowing them to grow things. It's out there, it's small. Do I think it's going to be huge? I don't know the overall economic ramifications of suddenly getting rid of all the superstores and that are huge. But is it enjoyable? Is it good? Does it provide learning opportunities? Absolutely. My four-year-old granddaughter comes over every week to Grandma's house. I have a garden on my patio. We grow herbs, tomatoes, and flowers, and she gardens. So we can each make the choice and do it in small ways. Our school's already provided. Our seniors have it. And we lead by example, which I always say. I mean, what you're speaking to is a a set of relationships, a whole other set of relationships that children and others are being exposed to with it. Yeah, and I guess in response to this conversation, too, I would like to say that I believe the local movement is much more than about food. Uh, You know, food is one aspect of it, but I think it's it's really about being engaged with the people that are around you and with the, the, the spaces that are around you. It's not, it's not, it's, it's much more than just about food. Yeah. We're going to move to uh, another trajectory. Um, I, I just wanted to ask if you had an internet connection, and, and if you do, um, if you do, how you can use it in moderation. I mean, after all, if you are... <laughs> a drug addict, it's not going to be much good to say, well, I'm going to use drugs in moderation from now on. I do have internet. I even have a Blackberry. (laughs) Because TELUS hasn't made it out to our farm yet. (laughs) Uh, Yeah, we have internet connection. You need to if you're in in business. However, I I don't, I'm not on Facebook. I'm not, you know, I think that blogging might be interesting someday, but I'm not a tweeter, I'm not a Twitterer, I don't, I just, I can't, I don't, I I actually don't know how people have time or space in their head. Um, And I feel like when when I lived in the city, I was much more sort of uh, obsessive about checking email or checking, you know, just going online, being sort of what plugged in to something, and I didn't even know what it was really, and until I realized it was a bit of an addiction, and I had to just step away and, and not do that. So yeah, I have internet, but I don't, I don't use it for anything except for what's, what's just necessary, checking the bank account, um, paying bills, I don't know. So that, does that answer your question? 
Um, do you have a cell phone? Oh, I have a Blackberry. Oh, oh right. That's, thank you. Yes. Yeah. Um, yeah. And, um, study, I even text. <laughs> studies have been done, I believe, um, whereby um, the um, the ping on your computer that tells you you've got a new email, or the um, the vibration of your Blackberry. Um, they give you a kind of positive stimulus. They, they mean something oh. novel is oh. happening in your one's boring life. You know? Right. Something yeah. exciting might be yeah. coming your way. And that's, um, from what I've read, that's the nature of the addiction. And um, it's, I mean, speaking autobiographically, it's a very hard addiction to get away from. It is. I think it takes a tremendous amount of self-awareness because I actually, when I carry my BlackBerry with me in the field, which I sometimes do because sometimes you know people are trying to contact you or whatever, it, I feel hmm, more anxious than if I leave it on my kitchen table and treat it as though it were a landline. So more often than not, I just leave it on my table and let it take messages. And when I need to check it, I treat it as though it were because I, it, it makes me crazy to be to be on call and to be sort of um, affected in that way by a small machine. Have, have you noticed uh, with the new um, credit cards that have chips on them that when you put them in to purchase something, it always says that you are approved of? <laughs> have you noticed that? So, I mean, I've decided to buy much more as a result. <laughs> Seeking approval, some sense of approval. No, I actually come from south of the border, and we, we're, we're very, very primitive there. We, we don't have the chips. <laughs> well, you will... You have something to look forward to, a certain amount of approval in the future. Uh, yes, Mark, we will. I wonder whether you could just say a bit more because it puzzles me. I mean, I, I, I sort of am in sympathy with you um, that um, communications via Facebook, Twitter, and all that stuff, um, something unsatisfying about it. But um, I'm wondering what exactly it is. I mean, what is it that you feel that you are missing when you um, just, you know, spend most of your communication time via some electronic media. Do you have, have you thought about that? Uh, so the, I, I just want to make, clarify the question. So what do I feel like I'm missing if I'm not engaged in Facebook or? No. 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 What are you missing if you do spend your time on Facebook and Twitter and do your communicating with other people that way? Um, oh, okay. As over against just face to face, face, to face. or over the phone. Yeah. Um, so, what do I personally feel like I'm missing if I use those other methods of communication with people? Right. Um, well, it's possible that you're not missing a great deal. Like, I think that you that it's possible to make genuine connections via Facebook or via Twitter, maybe less so with Twitter because it's so bitey. Um, but what I do think is that there is something larger about Facebook, for instance, where it promises you the opportunity to organize your life and to... Um, it, it promises more than what it actually offers. And, and that's what drives me crazy about it. Because I think... Um, I think what it actually takes from you is more than what you get from it in terms of uh, it taking your time and your, your social energy away from what's happening presently, you know, in, in the room around you. Um, and maybe it's because I've never gone as, I've never taken the leap and become a Facebooker or something that I feel that way, that I feel like I'm not missing anything because I haven't gone there yet. So I don't know what I'm missing, and I'm okay with that. But what drives me crazy is when, you know, my lovely younger sisters who are in the room with me, and I'm there, you know, I see them maybe once every two weeks or something to spend time with them, and they're like manically checking their, you know, their Facebook. And I'm just like, hello, 
you know, let's talk. And that doesn't happen nearly as readily with them as, say, my mom, who has nothing to do with Facebook. Um, and I guess that's what I resent about Facebook. And that's maybe a totally indirect answer to your question. Mark, you want to pursue that for um, I wonder whether you, you think that, I know you're not my generation, you're obviously my, <laughs> much younger than that, um, but I wonder whether there's some generational thing here going on. I mean, that um, if you grow up with the, uh, the um, electronic media as, as a means of communication, um, then um, you don't really miss um, what happens in face-to-face -face contact, or at least, at least, is it, 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 perhaps it's the case that um, because you can communicate with so many other people um, and so conveniently and easily, that um, that advantage more than makes up for the fact that. Um, you can, uh, in a face-to-face -face, uh, conversation, you can see the person's <laughs> face, right? And, and bodily movements and, 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 and that sort of thing. Um, so that um, um, maybe uh, if you grow up in a certain way, you don't miss what it is that you find you miss and I find that I miss. And, and then maybe should we worry about that? I, I'm, th these are just yeah. concerns I have, that, and I'm just interested if you've, you've thought about that at all. I have thought about it, I, I guess, and, and one of the things that pops into my mind is, um, is this, I, well, and it's a little bit, it's, it's slightly unrelated, but I think that it, it ties in with the same kind of um, trajectory that your questions are taking, and that is that I... I think that, uh, okay, this is about cars, because I think that what, what's happened in our, this is a, sort of a parallel conversation to the technology one, but cars have, ta have taken away the opportunity for people to, um, to meander, to follow natural courses, and this is, I read an essay by Wendell Berry a long time ago, and in it he talks about when you, when you walk from point A to point B, there's a very different sense of time, there's a different understanding of space, there's a different uh, interaction that, that's going on that's more genuine and more grounded. I, this was a long time ago that I read it, so I don't know exactly what he's saying, but this is what I remember, basically. And when you're in a vehicle traveling from point A to point B, you miss all of the nuances and you and you are in a different space in your head you're just i mean you're not physically engaged and most of us don't miss that at all because we're most of us car drivers and and we have no sense of what we're missing um and i think it's a loss frankly and maybe i'm you know maybe i'm i should have lived 200 years ago and i'm just in the wrong time in the wrong place um, because I long for that. I long for the ability. I have, I, there's no way that I can get rid of my car, but I long for that opportunity. And I think that maybe uh, while my sisters don't know what they're missing, um, they're missing it anyway, <laughs> whether they're cognizant of it or not. Your, uh, your kind of analogy to the automobile is, is interesting. The Germans have this beautiful word. They talk about a bumo, taking a bumo. I suppose in English, the closest we would have to it would be a ramble. Oh, okay. But it's the whole notion of purposeless journey. Or, to up the ante to uh, the larger traditions, it's what, what the Jews talk about with Sabbath. What does it mean to have a purposeless day? What does it mean to have a day where you are not defining your life by action, but you rest in being. So it's an um, interesting matter. 
I wanted to pick up an earlier comment in the same thread about how do people have time to watch so much TV or spend so much time in technology. So, well, one of the ways that our society has created that time is because we're not all growing our own food and we're not all making our own clothing, etc. So we have specialized in an increasingly complex society, we've specialized some of those roles. Um, because Sundog Organics is growing and we can buy from them, we need to spend less of our time um, growing, digging, preparing some of our food. So it seems to me that in a more complex society, if we do want to find ways about of how do we include various things in our world, we have to think about in what ways will we specialize and to what degree. And it may not be um, a good choice to spend a lot of time in certain kinds of entertainment. We may need to say, well, as an individual, as a group, as a community, we may want to spend less time in that and, and give up, um, I guess, the efficiency of, say, using a prepackaged um, food that's coming in a more ready-to-eat uh, form. And um, I struggle with that personally. But where is that line and what is the quality of my time? Where will I invest that time? Um, what kinds of things do I want in my life? Uh, I do grow quite a bit of, of our food. Um, and I do go to the farmer's market. Um, and those are some ways that I can have wonderful quality foods. I don't do so much about buying local clothing, for example, or local furniture, or local... Um, so there's... maybe food for me is a little more obvious choice, and the localism... I'm intrigued by what other kinds of things we might want to do locally. But, but there will be costs, there will be trade-offs, I guess is the point I want to make. Um, and for what will we trade, is the question. Yeah, I think that those are those are interesting points. I I think uh, if I reflect on my own experience, um, being caught up in food production, um, one of the things that I've traded is time with my kids, um, and this is a this is a tricky one for me because I think the the model of parenting today. Uh, the ideal that's presented is that you, you spend a lot of time with your kids nurturing them and playing with them and meeting them on their level and doing things with them all the time. And by necessity, I've had to extract myself from that role and um, be a working mom. And they are beside me, but I'm not making puzzles with them. I'm not digging in the dirt with them. They are doing that beside me and they are learning how to do what we do. Uh, which is, it's kind of fascinating, and at first I met it with quite a bit of guilt, um, because I thought, this isn't, this isn't my job, I'm supposed to be doing other things, I'm supposed to be uh, coloring with them, I'm supposed to be teaching them how to read, and, um, but they're learning so much, and I've had to just let go of that a little bit, and to trust that, um, that they're okay, that, they, that they're fine. And they are. They're a little dirtier than maybe some kids. <laughs> yeah. And so that's only that's one example of something that I've had to trade personally. Hi. Uh, thank you very much for your presentation. I'm really enjoying it. I like David. I enjoyed your an analogy with the motor car, because you know things like uh, highways, uh, suburbs, and downtown, and traffic lights, stop and go, stop and go. They're they're part of the product of a car. You know, uh, you, and you can't do without them. Uh, the other, but I really wanted to uh, come back to what uh, Martin picked up on uh, the, you know, what the uh, technology and the BlackBerry and all that is. What would be the result? And this is pointed to him rather than you. What would be the result of uh, this philosopher's cafe being held on the internet? What would we be losing? if we had it on the internet rather than meeting each other and making friends, which is exactly what you're doing in the farmer's market, you know. I mean, I really enjoy coming up here. If this was done on the internet, I don't think I would bother. You know, like you, I have, you know, my aversion to technology. Uh, you know, the Blackberry went down recently and everybody was up in arms about it. So, hello. <laughs> I don't think I noticed and I'm not Blackberry. <laughs> well, there you go. 
you know, I, you know it's, it's just amazing that, that something that, you, uh, that takes all your life, instead of being just an accessory for you, it takes your life and then you, you, you spend all your time on it, or, you, or your life is organized by it rather than you organizing, that's terrible. But uh, yeah, what would we miss you know, if we had this thing online? So, what would we miss? <laughs> well, I don't know. That, Martin that, can answer. <laughs> that was my question. You know, I know what I'd be missing. I'd be missing coming around here, you know, to talk to people, to meet people. I mean, I've made friends up here that I wouldn't have otherwise met. You know, I wouldn't have come, uh, met you. Or if, I, if, I, if you had uh, spoken on the internet, for example, and all I had was my computer to see your face and, uh, you know, have, listen to your conversation, it would not have meant the same thing as being up here and listening to you and listening to your, uh, you know, seeing your facial features, seeing, seeing the way you behave, and telling us about things that, you know, which are not communicable on, uh, on the internet. That's something that I would for sure miss. And I, I, that resonates with me too as a visual artist, because I think there's something about, um, about color and texture and uh, depth and all kinds of things about being in real time that are very rich and we just take those for granted we don't necessarily and, and that's okay to take them for granted but they're real and they exist and we respond to those things it seems to me uh, on Martin's point that the most obvious thing you miss if you spend your life in the virtual realm rather than a real reality, is touch. And you just have to think about mother and child to work out that there's a good argument that touch is the most important sensation we can have. So should we all take a minute to pat each other on the back? <laughs> yeah, I was just going to ask... Uh, well, probably two questions. To one, first, to what extent do you use now mechanical technologies in your garden? <laughs> that, that's one. Yeah. And, and second, the second question is, is it possible to at least make a partial living at organic farming? Mm -hmm. uh, because, you know, when I, when I think about it, probably many of us in this room, two generations or three generations ago, uh, can trace farming backgrounds. Yet none of us are doing that anymore. So, you know, to what extent is it viable to, to pursue this? Okay, um, so the first question was mechanical, use of mechanical equipment on our farm. Um, well, I often tell people that the only reason that we're farming is because my husband has a love affair with tractors. <laughs> we're on to number four, and we've been farming for three years. <laughs> that's, more than, that's more than enough. Um, and so we do use mechanical equipment. I was just at a, a very, very large local farm just this week having a, a best practices meeting, just interesting kind of conversation with the owner of the farm to see what, what they do and what, you know, what advice they had for somebody like me and the fellow that was farming with us this summer. Wow, what a different scale of... Um, of farming and, and reliance on mechanical infrastructure. So in a sense, yes, we do rely on mechanical technology to help us in some, in some ways, but we also, you know, it's pretty moderate, I guess. We have, we, have, um, we have some tractors and we use them for some soil preparation, for hauling. Um, what else do we use them for? We, we have a transplanter, a mechanical transplanter, and we've actually found that we prefer transplanting by hand. Just that, so I mean, um, we have some technology that my father-in-law has designed and built, like a carrot digger that just undercuts the carrots. And without those things, it would really slow down our production and our ability to make a living. Um, and now in response to your second, and if it were up to me, we would be using horse-drawn equipment. But my husband is, like I said, in love with tractors. Um, and in response to the second question, um, we... Sorry, we're, I'm pregnant. <laughs> I really... I, 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 Is it a viable oh, a viable living, yes, right. Um, it, it actually is a viable living. Um, 
And that's mostly as a result of the fact that we direct market everything that we grow. We, that we have no middle person. It's, you, I, I give you the carrots, you give me the money. There's nobody in there taking any percentage of what we make, uh, except that we do, we do supply the organic box with product, and then we give them a slightly discounted rate. But they've been very supportive of local agriculture and, and our farm in particular. Um, so yeah, it is viable to make a living. We don't make a big living, but uh, but you can make a, a very very good living. And and I think the more you mechanize, the greater your opportunity for uh, making a decent living is. But I think that we would, James and I struggle with that question a little bit. Like, how mechanized do we want to become? Because you lose something, I think, too, when you when you get very mechanized and you become very big. We do not want to be just managers of people running our farm. We want to be work, running the farm, working it, working the soil ourselves. And um, so that's a question. That's a question that we're really grappling with right now. If I can just follow up on that uh, issue of mechanization, do you have? Do you have any either principles in mind which which help in your judgment about the question of scale? Like at what scale do you really want to operate? Where do you begin to say, no, that's too much? I mean, it was so interesting to me to listen to the kind of two things you laid out at the end and the whole notion of both with your art as well as with your, your farming, that both of them are about soil. Both of them are about the soil of culture, the soil of the earth, and of a kind of healthiness and uh, sustainable possibilities. So when it comes to technology and the kind of scale of mechanization, uh, you will face this, of course, over and over again, I, I suspect. But could you just walk around that a little bit more for us? Sure, yeah. Um, I felt like this summer we were pushing the limits of, uh, of getting too big, which is interesting. We're only in our third year of farming. And, and I think in part that was because James was very absent in the sense that he was building, he was doing all kinds of infrastructure work, so I really had to take over um, harvesting and, and managing our employees. And, and so I was working largely on my own in that, in that sense, trying to get the, you know, the actual field work accomplished. Um, and I found that it was too much. We had at, at certain points eight and seven and eight full-time employees, and that was too much. So our big thing is next year we're scaling back. Next year we're making it smaller. We've grown in the past, uh, in our first two years of farming, we grew just under two acres of, soil, of land, uh, and, and we made a living at it, which is remarkable, really. Um, because we did it very carefully, intensively, and we were, yeah, extremely cautious about how we used that space. But um, this year we grew six acres, and six is a significant jump from two. And it, it's also very interesting to me because every conversation I have with the quote-unquote big farmers, the big local farmers, uh, they say, don't get too big. And this isn't just one of those farms, it's every one of them. And um, I was talking to the son-in-law of one of the, one of the farmers. He says, don't, don't get too big. And the other son-in-law said that to me in passing when I was having a visit, don't get too big. So that's interesting to me, you know. To, and, and I think um, you mentioned the Sabbath before. We don't, we don't do anything on Sunday at all. Because we can't <laughs> physically, <laughs> uh, but I know that other farmers do. They just go twenty four seven all the time, and I don't know. I really don't know physically how they can do it, mentally how they can do it. And so I think that once we start losing that rhythm, or we have just not do that. 
And this year it verged on it verged on too much, and that was a lesson for us that that we'll take into next year and say, okay, we're not growing that much. We're, we're going to concentrate on growing maybe better so that we don't lose uh, the income that we need to make to make ends meet. So we'll we'll concentrate on yeah on on uh, just refining things, and I think that's where it, that's where it lies a little bit refining and just making it. The quality uh, really, really beautiful, and I don't know, but it is something to I think to constantly be aware of. Yeah. Um, I've never met your husband, but I sell tractors, and I already like him. <laughs> um, What's your name? <laughs> uh, my name's Kevin Sharp. Okay, I want your card. Yeah, <laughs> I'm sure. get it too. Um, however, it's um, you know I, I guess basically one of the things that. You know, and I, I've grown, I, I've sort of had uh, machinery, sort of, I've grown up with it, I've been steeped in sort of, and, and sort of the farming tradition and how um, on the farm, uh, at, on the farm, uh, you know, basically we would have, up until recently, in fact, still you hear how farmers are stewards of the land. Oh, my. Um, and I would, uh, you know, I, and, and, it, and it's, it's a shame um, and it, this speaks to sort of the question of, um, you know, how do we get people engaged in, in uh, w where their food comes from and how important that is. And, and some of the things that we have lost because we do not know where our food comes from, one of the things that we have lost is that it has allowed corporations to determine, to tell us where our food comes from. It comes to sort of some of the, um, the discernment that needs, that needs to be um, put out into the public conversation as to where the food comes from and um, and sort of the life giving that can come from food production and also the life taking that can come from food, food production. Um, and you know, quite frankly, we're, I think that if people know where our food comes from, that's life giving. It's life giving. When we have uh, corporations telling us what we need to eat at they're basically modifying it for us. That's life taking, and I, I really think that um, you know these, these. I'm very glad that you were able to come and speak to us today, and I think that it's a starting point. I think that there are, you know, I really think that unfortunately, out on the farm, a lot of the a lot of the farmers, they'd love to be stewards of the land, but basically, it's gone past that point right now, from an economic from a, from a economic feasibility. They, they, they're stuck. It's kind of in a rut as to where yeah. it's gone. And um, however, I, you know, I also think that, uh, you know, for me, uh, soil is sacred. Mm -hmm. yeah. Can I respond to that? Mm -hmm. Unless somebody else wants Please. to. I, you know, uh, I'll just tell an anecdote, a personal anecdote. We we're farming on 14 acres in the middle of basically what is industrial agriculture. And I think um, the farmers who farm that land still consider themselves stewards of the earth, but I doubt very much whether they touch the soil very often at all. Mostly it's, you know, and J James said to me a couple weeks ago when there was combining happening, it's like we're in the middle of a factory, you know, and, and just the, the amount of, um, of spraying, we have airplanes, you know, in fields nearby, coming and and spraying, and I mean, we've we've seen industrial agriculture before, but not to this scale. It's pretty immense, and it's it's incredible, and that there's nothing romantic about that in my mind, and there's nothing really life giving about it actually either, and I uh, and I think that it's really difficult for the farmers who are farming in that way to see a way out. We've had many conversations about uh, farming with with her, and in fact, it's a good friend of ours who who you know farms the land surrounding us. And you know, he talks about, well, you know, it'd be great to go organic, but they are totally into a system that is um, really difficult to ex extract yourself from, and it makes them good money, and that's. I don't know. That's diff that's a difficult. It's a difficult thing. But I think if people were able to to go and observe farming in that manner or food production in that manner, 
they would second guess their, you know, buying a loaf of bread in the grocery store, knowing that it's been sprayed and sprayed and then sprayed again, and then sprayed one more time just before harvest so that everything is uniformly dead um, before it's harvested and goes into the, you know, the combine harvester nice and neatly. I just think if you're aware of that too, then you can also make other other choices about where you're getting your food from. I don't. What kind of far, uh, tractors do you sell? Um, <laughs> <laughs> well, wow, well, uh, perfect. Do you have a soapbox? Um, I actually sell John Deere equipment, so oh, okay. um, you know, basically, it's uh, and. Uh, I guess for I thought maybe the green shirt was a yeah, yeah. yeah. Huh. Well, here we go here let me get my hat uh-huh. um, however I guess basically um, I would have sort of been involved in up until about five years ago you know the, the big large you know the huge combines the huge tractors mm-hmm. I'll just kind of give you some kind of frightening statistics or, or, or frightening well yeah statistics basically um, one of our local farmers farms about 55,000 acres. Mm-hmm. Um, he would be the largest producer in, uh, in the area. But yeah, the, the, the machines that he, speaking of mechanization, the machines that he has, he would have 10 half million dollars, well, they're, the, the combines, they're half a million dollars. Mm-hmm. Um, and, you know, we've got guys that are using the same styles of machines, um, uh, you know, farming, trying to farm perhaps 1,500 acres. And that one time they were fairly large farmers, not anymore. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, at some point, I, I'm not quite sure where it's going, but it kind of scares me. Mm-hmm. Um, I, I basically sell to market gardeners. I look at, I, you know, I sell tractors under 65 horsepower now. Mm, that was okay. a conscious choice. Oh, okay. I'm, uh, I'm not, you know, I'm, I'm, I basically have divested myself of the corp, of the, of the large farm. And, um, you know, it's still out there and it's where, you know, basically that's where we, you know, in the United States, like in North America, that's still the business model out there. Um, However, it's, uh, you know, there are, there are other ways. Um, you know, we, we kind of talked about how far back we'd have to go. And I, um, you know, really, if you got sort of back into the mixed farming, you said you thought that maybe you belonged 200 years ago. Well, I don't think so. But, I, uh, you know, I would suggest probably 19, uh, you know, 1945 50. to 50 yeah. would work. <laughs> I think you're right. And I think, too, that... Um, in a, in, a, in a sense, we're not going back at all. What James and I are doing is going forward. I, I really believe that, actually. And I think that that's... Uh, I think I, re- I, I read somewhere... I can, I'm sorry that I can't quote to you from, from where I found this information, but the fastest-growing agricultural sector is small farms like ours in North America. And that's encouraging, I think. Um, but also... Uh, the, you know, the fellow who's farming the land around us, he has a couple of partners who don't share this vision, but his vision for where we are uh, is, in, uh, the soil is amazing, and, and his father was once a vegetable grower, and his vision is to go back in that direction, um, and he, he sort of shepherded us into that area and connected us with the fellow who we purchased the land from, because he, I think he really sees it as a beacon of hope for the future. And I think that's really, that's fascinating. On the other hand, he's been very encouraging and very supportive of what we're doing, but we've been met with, you know, like lots of head shaking and like, what are they doing? And those guys are crazy because they're working way too hard. And (laughs) um, so there's been some of that too. You know, I had, I had lots of high hopes for relationships with neighbors and stuff, but mostly they kind of drive by going woo <laughs> yeah so it'll take a few years to I don't know make friends and see change happen okay I can um, I, I, maybe I'm off course my family has a hundred year old a century dairy farm and when I look back at all the summers I've spent there watching my grandmother make bread three times a week it was very enriching and, I, and I'm glad to hear that it's growing 
because it serves a huge purpose. I think we've become very disconnected as a society. Do I want to get rid of every technological piece of item out there? No. Do, am I on Facebook? Yeah, I have two sons in the Middle East and that's the only way I can track who's doing what, when, where, and how. But is it a case of moderation? Yes. As far as John Deere tractor goes, up until she was 80, and this 45, 50 year old tractor mysteriously couldn't be repaired anymore, my grandmother cleaned the fields every few weeks with her sunbonnet on that John Deere. She did it faithfully. I think personally what you're doing is a good thing. Your message is positive. Uh, I saw the words globalization when I initially came in here and I thought, okay, it's going to be bash the world kind of a thing. And, and that's not appropriate because our whole economy wouldn't allow for us to change overnight. But can we start looking at making changes? Yes, absolutely. And they're good changes. If you have a John Deere tractor, you of course are a green farmer. You know, we, I, I hate to say it, we're Massey Ferguson folks. <laughs> um, that brings up the whole uh, uh, machinery, but brings up a question in my mind. Do you find that um, that they are that tech, the the direction in which uh, farm technology is moving? is becoming more favorable to small farms, or do you think it's moving in the opposite direction, that is, that the technological developments, the new tractors, whatever it is that uh, they produce, are <clears throat> aiming at the uh, large farm market and uh, ignoring the small farms? In, in other words, what I'm wondering here is, uh, is how much the viability of small farms is being affected by the way in which um, the big corporations are developing the technology. Oh yeah, certainly the you know the mechanization or the mechanical equipment that's available, especially in Alberta, is very not directed towards our kind of farm. So uh, do you, maybe yeah, you could probably respond to that better than me. But I'll just it's difficult for us to find the equipment that we need to a certain extent. Um, we have. Um, we have connections in the eastern part of uh, North America, Michigan, namely, and there are, uh, you know, more vegetable growers there, and so on. And uh, interesting, interestingly, I think there is a shift. I think there that the uh, equipment sector, or whatever you call it, is becoming more aware of filling the needs that are growing in our type of industry. Um, but I think here in Alberta, it's not you can probably respond to this better, but it's not at there where we need it yet, where James and I need it. So what we find ourselves doing is fixing old equipment. Uh, James's father is a master at restoring antique equipment. Um, and so we have, you know, we have equipment that's been, we, we drive, um, well, our smallest tractor is a Massey Ferguson pony. I don't, you're probably familiar, no? We do have one John Deere, actually. But, um, so I do think it's shifting. And oh, I was going to say too, my brother-in-law is also a vegetable farmer. And he and my husband had a conversation a couple of years ago and he said, yeah, um, it's becoming harder because it used to be easier for, he's been doing it much longer than we have. And he said it used to be much easier to find, you know, the used equipment that they needed to run their farm. And he said, now it's, it's becoming more difficult because more and more farms are cropping up that need that kind of equipment. Um. I think that you'd find that uh, corporate America is very aware of the people moving back to the land and um, the need for um, smaller, low-priced or lower-priced equipment than sort of the traditional uh, the, the traditional equipment that would, they would use on the standard farm. Um, sort of to give you an idea, uh, we basically one of the largest growing. Um, the visions in deer right now would be uh, what they call their, basically it's their GPS or their um, baby precision farming and, and, and in the large farms um, you know basically they're able to accurately measure uh, exactly how many seeds go in per acre and how many you know how sort of 
pounds per acre and exactly on what line those that fertilizer is being put down. And basically when they're putting fertilizer and you raise, this allows them to, it's huge efficiencies, it, it's allowing for huge efficiencies. However, on top of that, I think some of them, the, I would suggest that the, uh, that they're very aware of uh, the smaller, the smaller, what they call uh, the sundowners. So basically they're, they're, they're looking more to the, the people who have sort of would be people in this room that have gone up, who have had farming roots, have gone out, have worked professionally in the city and are now at the age of retiring and they want to go back and they want to grow their own food. It's a growing movement. Um, you know, basically deer has, you know, I suggest probably in the last three, well, maybe three to five years, um, they have a factory that in India, um, basically they develop two-wheel drive, it's a two-wheel drive tractor similar to sort of the old John Deere 4020 that grandma still drives. Um, but basically it's a mechanical tractor. It's mechanical gear drive, you know, you're not having a power shift transmissions. You get in and it's one speed and then you stop and clutch and shift and it's second gear. So it's out there and, um, you know, basically a 55 horsepower tractor, you about 15,000 bucks is kind of what it sells for. Uh, you can give your orders directly to Kevin. <laughs> so I think we'll take a break and people can um, refresh their tea and we do that for 10-15 minutes and then we talk together a little bit and then we'll come back and talk together. Thanks so much. You're welcome. Thank you very much. <laughs> Well, my table mates here have insisted that I should, uh, I should make a little uh, discourse on why the universities of Oxford and Cambridge are market gardens. Uh, and the, the analogy is with the direct involvement in the work one does. Uh, when you talked about the internet and television uh, I, of course, thought in, as, a, as a university teacher, I thought in terms of the classroom. And we can do a lot of distance education nowadays, and it's probably right that we should do it. But you're losing something. I thought of being in a seminar room with a dozen students and interacting directly face to face. There's something that you it's hard to define, but there is something that you get out of that that you wouldn't get out of sitting in a computer lab with computer screens looking at each other. And then extending that one stage further uh, to the uh, question of a residential university. Uh, because the, the ancient universities were residential, and again, there's something that you get out of living and dining with each other that you don't get out of commuting to the university every day and then going back home at night. There's a further analogy, because this kind of instruction is expensive, especially if you're living away from home. Uh, but it, what you get for the expense is something that's, uh, uh, that's irreplaceable. And as I thought about it, I thought about my college, which on the other side of the camp has a nice field, which cows come in and graze once in a while. And, and I thought, there it is. Uh, the universities of Oxford and Cambridge are run by market gardeners. So, uh, and, and your tutor uh, is giving you the individual attention that you're giving to that plant when you, when you transplant it. Uh, there's probably a principle at stake here that can be applied rather broadly uh, across many different activities. And uh, our assignment, it seems to me, to, just to make one final comment, is to strike the balance. I'm sure even in your farm there are elements of globalization. And it's nice to be able to get in touch with MIT and Yale and places like that to get the latest ideas. But it's also essential to have the, the local element, somebody you can talk to, 
uh, and, and, and striking that balance is the art, and I suspect that it would probably have something very interesting to say on globalization and the element of globalization in what you do locally. May I leave it at that? I feel like I need to do a little reading to <laughs> get my thoughts in order to respond to that. Um, I'm trying to think how globalization plays a part on our farm. Because in some ways, I don't think you can... Yeah, I don't think you can get more local, in a sense, than what we do talking to our customers and offering them the fruit of our labor, you know, so directly. Um, but yeah, I, on the other hand, in, my husband, okay, in response to the how do you use, or how do you, um, somebody, I forget now, the question was something like how do you use technology on your farm or how, uh, in terms of the internet. Well, my husband is on Kijiji always looking for tractor parts and this and that. <laughs> he has a bit of an addiction. Um, yeah, and we, I don't know how to, I don't know exactly how to respond. Well, I'm struck, uh, Nicholas, by your image of the seminar and sitting around in the seminar. That clearly is the original face book. Yeah. <laughs> or at least facing a text. Yes. Martin. Just to add to what Nicholas said, there's also um, the um, examinations uh, that are given for uh, master's theses and uh, PhD dissertations. Um, it's become uh, more and more common to uh, just uh, contact uh, the external examiner or even sometimes the, the internal examiners who happen to be away from the uh, university at the time of the exam um, by some sort of uh, connection. Sometimes it's just a, uh, a telephone connection. Um, sometimes they use Skype. Um, and, um, you know, uh, I'm trying to get an idea here together and uh, <laughs> I'm not sure I can put it together, but the thing which uh, it seems to me bothers me about all of these things is that um, they abstract out uh, certain aspects of the uh, situation in question uh, which are uh, crucial for the declared end of the process. Um, like, I mean, when um, you take a course online, uh, they abstract out the, um, the words, uh, the lectures of the, uh, of the lecturer, which is indeed a crucial part in, the, in that learning process. Uh, but then they forget about all the rest of it, right? I mean, the, the interaction between the, the professor and the student, which goes on in an ordinary classroom, um, and uh, which is a two-way interaction. I mean, it affects both uh, how the lecturer uh, performs, how he adapts his lecture, and it affects the student, right? Um, that's abstracted away from, but <clears throat> in a way, it's, 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 it's not at the very core of the process, right? It's, it's something which is somewhat peripheral. Um, and uh, there's this constant tendency to um, forget about anything which is peripheral. There's a constant tendency to think about what is, um, what is the single core purpose of this thing? How can it be achieved in the most direct, efficient way? And then you don't worry about all the periphery. But as uh, Nicholas was pointing out, um, really the periphery does count for an awful lot, right? Okay, that's... 
Well, and it strikes me I'm, um, also that maybe why I have a hard time answering your or responding to your questions about how globalization uh, interacts on our farm is because right now I am so entrenched in the physical, tangible reality of harvesting beets or carrots or whatever it is that I'm presently engaged in, that I, I hardly have time to really think about... I mean, and one would think that that would open up all kinds of space to do thinking, but it doesn't, because you're thinking about how freezing cold you are or whatever. Um, how maybe that, that sort of physical reality makes it hard to... Uh, to reflect in that, in that kind of way? A little bit like um, in fact it was on uh, Wednesday we did our big beet harvest for this season and I'm sitting there cutting beets into buckets thinking what is this that we're doing again like why why are we you know you're just doing the same thing over and over and you're thinking why are we doing this it's so ridiculous and it's so physical and it's demanding and the wind was whipping and uh, so and I and I feel like I'm still reeling in you know I woke up at 5:30 this morning so I could get ready to be at market and I served my customers until I came here and presented this and maybe I'm so stuck in the physical reality of it right now that it's hard for me to you know to see the bigger picture yeah give me a couple of weeks <laughs> yeah or years maybe yeah part of the um, the, the the earlier. Uh, conversation before before we broke for tea, and then what both Nicholas and, and Martin have raised here, uh, there is an interesting connection to me. And when we think of the university and the the example that you used, Martin, uh, is not part of the issue that what is deemed central is, has shifted. So what is deemed central these days is the certification. What is deemed central is getting the qualification, and. I would suggest, I'd be interested in your comments, Nicholas, if getting the qualifications was central at Cambridge when you were there. I mean, in this sense, getting that certification, you can thin things down so that, in fact, a whole set of things fall away in terms of what constitutes a fine education, what constitutes the shaping of the mind, the shaping of conversation, your ability to think with others, and the forging of those relationships. Huge set of relationships go into that kind of education that you described. When you Skype people on their doctoral dissertation, I mean, when you do it that way, when you no longer have it as a public event, including tomatoes, I mean, you really have changed the relationship pretty dramatically, haven't you? How do you see this? Well, yes, of course your degree is a qualification, and uh, the phrase that they use, the just ubiqua docendi, the right to teach anywhere, goes with my degree. Uh, but it implies, in this case, it implies all of that, quote, peripheral, unquote, uh, experience. That, that you've had. And if you have this kind of degree from this kind of institution, that is assumed to go with it. And uh, I, I think Martin summed it up beautifully, actually. I, I zeroed in on, on, on really what was happening. Uh, and, and, it, and as he said, Martin, I agree with you. It's, it's important. It, it, it's, if, you, if you are missing out on that, you are missing out on something that looks peripheral but is really essential. Would you buy that? Uh... And um, I think David has a point too. I mean, there's a, a constant tendency to construe the essential goal as something which can be uh, very objectively measured. Um, in farming, I mean, um, you construe the essential goal as production of a, a crop uh, with the least 
the, what was I say? The, getting the most crop out of the most uh, out of the least um, money actually that's put into it, right? Um, so that um, you're um, in a way using money uh, most efficiently in this in this process, um, and rather than uh, what would traditionally have been thought of as a central goal which is uh, producing healthy food in sufficient amounts to keep <laughs> the population healthy, right? I mean... Um, and doing it in relationship yeah. to a whole bunch of things. Well, but that's, that's what I was thinking of yeah. as the periphery, that's you right, see, yeah. uh, which is important. Um, but there's also, as, as I think you're quite correct, there's also this tendency to, to narrow the central yeah. goal down to something which is was really just a piece of the original central goal that we that we had. Or it may in fact have been only one of the results, but not the central point. It's a result. But, yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, I see another link. I don't know if it's correct or not. But if you go back to the very first talk that you mentioned where you had four tractors, in order to have four tractors, you have to be able to pay for four <coughs> tractors. To pay for four tractors, you have to sell produce. S to sell produce, people have to buy it. So, for every tractor I own in my small farm, I need a certain number of people to not be on the farm. Mm -hmm. Now, we can take that to the level of the half million dollar tractor owners, which we heard about. They need many more people. And the same ratio will apply. And eventually you reach a system which, which says uh, we need to live together, but we need to have people who do not do things together. Mm -hmm. Which is a contradiction in terms. I can only summarize it in one way, and that includes the discussion on degrees and PhDs and so on. Any mass production saves time and money and reduces quality. And it doesn't matter what we talk about. With education, if you had, if you were very wealthy hundreds of years ago, you could have a tutor for your child. We can't do that today. So we have mass production, and we lose quality. Also applies to food. I don't think there's a solution to that. I don't know if you can stop people with mass production by saying to them, you can't earn a ball in a certain amount of money. Don't get too big. You were telling us your farmers tell you that. I don't know how you could do that. I don't think you can. But they're getting big not because there's a need, even though they may say so, but because of this money thing which says they own money to the bank, the bank has to make mm -hmm. money, the tractor maker has to sell his tractors and so on. It's not a very easy solution. I don't know if anybody else does, I'd be interested to hear. One thing that I forgot to mention before when, David, when you asked about, um, you know, how, how do you decide how big to get or how do you decide, you know, at what, at, at what point are you not sustainable anymore, are you sustainable or, uh, what, one of James and, one of our goals as a couple is um, to have a farm that just allows us to subsist. However, we had to buy land and because we bought a small amount of land, uh, it's essentially an acreage. It was not sold to us uh, as agricultural land, which goes for quite a bit less. We had to buy it as acreage land. So we paid a lot of money for our small piece of soil and borrowed a lot of money. And so we're forced into a situation where we have to market our produce in order to pay for the lifestyle that eventually we would like to have. Um, so right now, our goal is to pay for what we, what we need to, but ultimately, um, it's our goal to have a place where, if our children desire, they can live sustainably and comfortably without having to make, you know, X number of sales to buy another tractor. We're hoping that you know, we can provide some of that for them and for ourselves eventually, too. I, th that's sort of in response, but... I 
I'm just going back to a comment that was made a while ago, and, and I think we keep hitting on, and, and, and there's an implication that we do not have choice. We do. We're all accountable. We're all thinking human beings, and we can make choices. Nobody is going to tell me what to buy, what to wear, or how to live. And the, to imply that mass media is doing that, then that means we're allowing that to happen to us, right? So we have to, as individuals, reflect on that and decide how we're going to turn that around, how we're going to improve our education, how we're going to quit spoon-feeding everybody quickly so that we're, you know, mass-producing all these degrees that are out there, but we're not producing critical thinkers, people who are going to look and address the issues that are important. We're not going to have these massive, I, I'm, I'm irritated right now, so I will touch on this, um, groups of people that are protesting, I'm not quite sure what, here in Canada, because we're very fortunate, and dropping out of school, because I see no reason, why would you drop out of school if you're going to initiate change, right? So, when people are doing that, I'm wondering how good the education system is at this point out there. We need more thinkers. We need to recognize we do have a choice. We do have the ability to make our own choices. We are all accountable. And that more small movements initiated in this way are going to produce better results. Well, I'm going to play devil's advocate, and that is that farmers, the farmers that I know anyway, they do not want their children to be farmers. They feel that the life their children would have as, as farmers would be much too difficult, much too perilous, much too uncertain. What they want is they want their children to come to the city to get an education not one necessarily that involves critical thinking, but an education that will give them a regular, sustainable income. Uh, they want their children to be able to have a nice house in the suburbs, you know, a couple of cars in the garage. Uh, this is their hope for their children. And every generation wants the children to have a, an easier life than the generation before it seems to me. Um, and so, in some ways, I think that this whole, like you need a massive, massive paradigm shift in terms of uh, expectations to, to go the route that we're talking about. I think probably uh, you should clarify or what you call a farmer, because I, I think that, that that may have been true. Mainstream far, mainstream farmers in the you know back to the into the 80s, perhaps when there still was some physical labor on traditional farms. Um, I'm not speaking about market gardens because there still is a huge amount of manual labor on a farm such as yours. However, if you were to look at um, Really, I would suggest that um, the average farmer in, well, in, in, in this area right now is actually, um, you know, they drive around in air-conditioned cabs for approximately 200 hours in the fall. Uh, they drive around in air-conditioned cabs for about 125 hours in the spring, and then they market some grain for the rest of the year. Um, I think that uh, that sounds like a pretty good lifestyle. I drive around in a large four-wheel drive Suburban. I have a brand new home. Um, my children have the best and the biggest of everything. And you could argue a case for that as the average farm. I totally agree, I've seen that. But on the other hand, 
If you take a look, if you, if you say fly over the land and take a look at what's down there, you will see one actual farmstead miles and miles and miles and miles and miles away from another actual farmstead. In this area, there are acreages in between. These people do not farm. Uh, they work in the city. They farm the city <laughs> and live on the soil. Uh, so farms, right now, if you're interested, there's an, oh, I'll give a little plug, there's a wonderful show at the uh, Art Museum in Red Deer uh, on the disappearance. It's a, there's, um, there are three or four artists that have put together this show and it's on the disappearance of the farm, uh, the traditional farm. All that's, that's left now is agrobiz. Was Lyndall Osborne a participating oh, yeah, yeah. of that show? Yeah, okay, I knew about that when it was a seed in her brain. Maybe I can uh, change the topic uh, here a bit. Um, the last cafe that we had was um, about the impending breakdown of um, fossil fuel supplies. And uh, a, uh, I don't know whether it's going to be a slow end to globalization or a catastrophically fast end to globalization, etc. Um, but um, I wonder if you have given any thought to uh, what would happen if uh, the price of uh, petroleum um, went sky high um, and other fossil fuel products and uh, how you would uh, r run your farm under those conditions? I suppose I have given it some thought. James and I have, I mean, loosely talked about the fact that we feel like we're in a much more it's it's a little bit ironic because we have you know loans up the yin yang and lots of debt and so on but at the same time we feel much more secure in our world now than we did living in a small infertile plot in the city uh, because I think yeah if worst comes to worst we can grow food we can grow food and what more do you need um, so, I mean, that's sort of like the most extreme version or scenario of what you've proposed. Uh, but it, yeah, certainly has crossed my mind. One of the things I think is how would we get our vegetables, you know, to people if that happened? Because though we live close to the city, and that was one of our uh, primary deciding factors that you know uh, we we bought 45 minutes away from Edmonton because that's where our customers are. Um, yeah, how would you get the food to those people? But I think in that situation, it might become uh, much more um, important for people to come to us as well because we would have the food, right? And 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 also the knowledge. Uh, about how to grow the food. Because I think food will become, I mean, in that event, in the, in the case where fuel costs become, you know, so extreme that it's difficult to import everything that we eat from China, from California, from Argentina, um, <clears throat> local food will become very, uh, very important. And I think that people will find a way to get to us, maybe. <laughs> I don't know. But I do, I do take a lot of um, comfort, maybe, in the fact that we have we have a place to grow food. Um, yeah, I'm, <clears throat> I'm certain that under those circumstances, uh, people would find a way to get to you. <laughs> I mean, out of sheer necessity. Um, and um, but I'm, I'm wondering on the on your farm. Um, what this means for the technology that you would use on the farm, how you would change that. Um, I remember um, um, looking at uh, museums mm -hmm. of old farm technology 
um, that comes back from near the turn of the 20th century, right? Mm -hmm. And uh, I've always been impressed by the fact that um, they had very clever contrivances and machines. I mean, it was, <laughs> this was no um, uh, unsophisticated kind of technology. Mm -hmm. It's just that most of it wasn't a power driven. It, it was something that, uh, well, either animal driven or, or the human being himself mm -hmm. applied his own energy to it. And I'm wondering whether um, that's uh, a possible option that um, contrivances like that might come back in. I think it's possible. I think James and I, uh, we've had conversations. My, my husband's actually a, more of a philosopher than I am for sure. He, he, he really should be here, but he's running the market. And, um, but he, we've had conversations this summer about how, how really satisfying physical, the physical labor of what we do is to have a tired body at the end of the day. And, and we've talked about, okay, well, what if we get rid of the tractors? Because that's something that we... We, I, though he has a love affair with tractors, he also um, understands the power of physical labor, maybe, in terms of uh, the satisfaction that it brings you, but also just... And, and I do think on our scale of farm, we could get away with, with, with very little mechanical equipment. Um, so we've talked about maybe the honoring of that physical labor and, and those other technologies, simpler tech, they're not simpler, but um, less fossil fuel reliant technologies on our farm as alternatives to uh, what we currently use. And we don't actually use our tractors that much. We have them, for sure, and, and James enjoys them, but they're not... They're not the sort of core of how we don't rely on them to the extent that we could not farm without them. Um, additionally, and I'm I'm really excited about this. I mentioned that my father-in-law is a uh, he has an affinity for antiques and antique farm equipment in particular, and he has a very large, comprehensive collection of equipment, and he. Um, He's built it up over the years at, at, at attending farm auctions and antique auctions throughout North America. It's a really wonderful, wonderful collection. And this summer, at the beginning of the, no, it was the end of last summer, he called us and said, you know, um, the antique dealer is coming to look at my collection. So if there's anything in here that you want to buy, you should come and get it now because, you know, I'm going to start selling it off. And James and I went over there, and um, we looked at everything, and we thought, "That's not a That's not an option. We, he can't. We can't let him sell it off." So we offered to buy the entire collection, which is really, you know, maybe foolish financially, because this is his retirement, one of his retirement packages. But we felt like um, he's collected this amazing and. Uh, very um, unique collection of equipment that that we would like to have on our farm, and maybe eventually as a you know part of a a little museum or some sort of place where we you know here it is, and maybe we will use some of it. In fact, we do use we use antique equipment in our fields. We we use um, wheel hose. Are you familiar with those? They are a very wonderful time-saving device for weeding between rows and they're all, you know, we have we use very old ones and we've just keep kept them conditioned and um, so yeah, I think that's an interesting factor in, in what, you know, the kind of farm that we have. There's a point that you alluded to some time ago and it hasn't been picked up and I'm really curious you mentioned that before you settled down and put roots into this locality you would lived in a number of other places and I gather that includes Europe and I wonder if you'd like to comment on what you learned elsewhere that you brought to this locality and how your previous experience has affected your present lifestyle 
That's the globalization. That's, I was just going to say, that's where the globalization fits in on our farm. <laughs> um, yeah, I've lived in a number of different places. I think probably in my own life, the most transforming um, global experience that I've had was having lived in, in Bangladesh when I was um, 14 and 15. That was at a very, I was very malleable at that time of my life, and I, um, I had quite a few opportunities to be in the rural parts of Bangladesh, where I observed firsthand, and I didn't, it didn't occur to me then necessarily as a 14, 15 year old person that I would someday be farming or someday be working the soil, but I, um, I guess I remember so very often when I'm working in my own field, just the the, the shape of the bodies working in the fields in Bangladesh and that kind of um, rhythmic, you know, I remember planting the rice or watching people plant the rice. I didn't partake of it myself. And, um, and just that it's possible to live very small and very efficiently and very beautifully, really. Like, it's beautiful. And, and there were, I mean, there, I think now it's changed drastically. There's a lot more reliance on vehicular transport and so on in a, I haven't been back to Bangladesh since I was 20 but um, but but just the like uh, I guess the the experience of having been in in villages there and having spent time just that sort of it's a different it's a different completely different paradigm or place to be physically and I and I, that means a lot to me living in places that are built of natural materials and um, and somehow that impressed me fairly deeply and James um, had some experiences living in Honduras before we were married and that also impressed him in terms of just the um, reliance on physical labor to get you through to get a meal on your plate at the end of the day, maybe. Uh, I'm sure there are other experiences having lived in different places that have impressed me, but I probably, th I think those sort of visceral memories of being in, in that place for me are the strongest. Yeah. Well, thank you so much, Jenny. That's terrific. Appreciate it. Thank you. I, um, I just want to say thank you as well. I feel really humbled to be in the presence of all these philosophical minds and <laughs> brilliant people. All like of us actually farmer. feel humbled to be in each other's presence as well. <laughs> Occasionally humiliated. <laughs> the next uh, Philosopher's Cafe is on the 29th of October. And it, the theme is, is social networking creating a new politics and uh, it will build on several themes and I'm sure will counter in a firm and definite way several themes that were raised today and uh, that'll be Rebecca so hope you can join us thanks again Jenny well, thanks, Steve.